Good morning, Grace Church. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Would you all stand up? We're going to worship the Lord this morning. what faith is for when I see a flood you see a promise when I see a grave you see a door when I'm at my end you see where my future starts I don't know how you make a way but I know you will I don't know how you make a way church will stand. Nothing has ever once surprised you, and nothing has ever made you flinch. When it all shakes out, the gates of hell don't stand a chance. That's right, amen. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. I don't know how you make a
Yes, it is. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Come on, we're going to sing this together. Even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Your presence fills the temple with 
Let's pray together. Father God, we are honored to be here in your name, united in love and purpose, and we just want to give you all the honor and the glory and the power because it's yours. We're just saying what's true. You are holy and set apart and mighty in all ways, God. And we're so grateful that you've called us into this beautiful story of redemption and uh, just want to express our gratitude and our love for you. God, I know there are people in this room that struggle to get here this morning that deal with chronic pain, chronic health issues. You know who they are, God. I pray that you would reach down right now and let them know that you are with them. Wrap your arms around them and comfort them, relieve their pain, their anxiety, whatever they're dealing with. Give them an extra dose of who you are, God. Get, increase their capacity to understand your presence and to feel your love. I pray for the peace that passes all understanding for everyone in this room. I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear from you through music, through prayer, through giving, and through your word, God. We are here for you, and we are at your mercy. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Before you have a seat, would you just turn around and say hi to the people around you? Good morning, Grace Church. How are you today? Good. I like to hear that. You guys can have a seat if you haven't already. Uh, my name's Daniel, um, and I'm here to welcome you this morning. Um, it's always, I love getting to host on Sundays because it's just a different opportunity to see all of the faces of the church here on Sundays, and it really it's just an amazing experience. So I thank you guys for being here because it really changes my Sunday and makes it awesome. Um, if you're new here, um, we want to get to know you uh, more intimately and closer. Um, and a couple of ways that we can do that is if you text, the, the first way is if you text the word connect me with no spaces to 411247. Um, if you do that, you'll be sent a link. Um, you can follow that link and it'll take you to an online form you can fill out. And give us a little bit of information about yourself, your background. If you have any prayer requests, that's a great spot um, to put those in. And someone will pray for you throughout the week. And then someone will reach out to you too and just get you more plugged in with what we do here at Grace. Um, the second way is after the service today in the southeast corner of the, the sanctuary, uh, there's a big sign back here. It says seven minute meeting. And it's exactly that. It's a meeting that's about seven minutes long where you can meet somebody from the pastor team and they'll tell you uh, about what we do here at Grace and why we exist. Um, so that's a really good spot to um, get more familiar with what we do here. And then lastly, if you need um, any prayer today, if you have a prayer request or you are going through something and you need to talk to somebody about it, um, we have a pastor team here that was happy to sit down with you. If you just sit, take a seat in the wooden pews out in the west or the east side of the lobby, someone will be with you after the service um, and can sit down and talk with, talk with you about whatever you need. Yeah, so next week we have something really exciting happening. There's a man named Gene Apple who's a very well-known speaker, preacher um, throughout the country. And I actually had the opportunity to, um, to be in his church for about 10 years. Daniel was actually dedicated there when he was about three months old, right before we moved to Reno. So uh, Gene is now the, the pastor at Eastside Christian Church in the Southern California area, but he, when I lived in Las Vegas, he grew the church that I was in exponentially, like by five times. When I left, it was about 10,000. Now I think that church is around 30,000 people. Um, and the reason I dropped that is because he's got great impact. It's, um, he's not about numbers, he's about life change. And so um, it's really a treat to have him here and I just wanna encourage you to come. He'll be speaking at all three services on the faithfulness of God through his church. So don't miss that, Gene Apple next weekend. Um, men's night is on Tuesday. So for those of you who have been before, you know it's gonna be a good time. For those of you who haven't been before, 
It's awesome. It's a really great place to connect with just the other guys that go to this church. And really, honestly, a great space for us to develop new relationship and just get to know one another better and become better friends. There's going to be sports on the TV. There will be activities like putting and, you know, it's just a good place to hang out. And there will be a short word on moving closer to Jesus as well. And tacos, right? Oh, yeah. Ta actually, um, uh, it's fajitas now. So oh. we like add a little sizzle to the uh, to the taco <laughs> night so that'll be that'll be fun ladies we're meeting the very next night for Galentine's night we're like making that last for the whole month so dress up if you want to you don't have to but we're gonna some of us will do that we'll have cheese and chocolate and Jill Tolls is gonna be our speaker you know Jill right yeah Jill was one of my professors in college yes. She's great yes she's <laughs> serving her last term as an assemblywoman powerful, powerful story. She told it to me over the phone, moved me to tears. So don't miss it. It will be a great evening. And there will be child care for both um, men's and ladies night, correct? Right. right. Sweet. Um, uh, as uh, many of you are aware, there's, uh, there's a, a, a school bus crisis in Washoe County right now. Um, there's not enough drivers and routes are being cut and it's becoming a lot more difficult for children to get to school. And, and we don't normally do this, but we have a really big heart for children here at Grace. Um, so it, are there any bus drivers in the room right now? Any bus drivers? We had three last yeah. service. Well, well any, anyways, yeah. if there are, I can't see because of the lights, but let's give the bus drivers in our church a hand because they're doing really good work. Um, yeah, and you know, one way that we can engage in the community is just to put this out there. Hey, if you're looking for a part-time job or any kind of job, uh, log on to WashoeCountySchools.net and consider being a bus driver. It'd be a great way to help us get through this crisis. I know there's a lot of parents that would really appreciate it. And it's just another way that we can serve our community. Yep. Um, so every week we take a moment to set aside a time to consider uh, generosity and being faithful with the money that God has blessed us with. Um, and so th the reason we do that is because the, we believe that giving changes the heart. And, and here at Grace, we never have and we never will ask you to do more than God leads you to do. Um, but what we have always asked and what we will always ask is that you engage with God and you follow his lead in, uh, in your generosity with the money that God has blessed you with in your life. So the instructions for that will be on the screen. And again, we're just so glad you're here. Welcome. And um, yeah, just take a minute to be with God. Thanks for being here, y'all. Would you all stand as we continue to worship together? This is my beginning, the line drawn in the sand, the end of all my striving, now I am born again. Oh, that Jesus was forsaken. So I'll never be His grace is my salvation The gift of God The work of Calvary It is done It is finished Christ has won He is risen
Would you continue to sing with me?
Come on, we're going to give him all of our praise and all of our worship this morning. Yeah, come on. Let's put our hands together. I'll give you all, give you all. Keep them up. I will give you all of my life, all of my worship. Christ wants everything. He wants all of you. He, he wants your worship, and he wants the worship of surrendering your hurts to him, surrendering your hang-ups to him. I want to speak to the person in this room who feels like there's a part of you that's too messed up, part of you that's too far gone, that the enemy is convinced that that part could never be saved. Jesus is enough. The blood of Jesus is enough to cover anything in you or anything you've done. All we have to do is give it to him. So let's go to prayer right now. Father God, we love you. And we praise you. We come before you, Father, just asking for you to speak to us today. That you would open up our hearts to hear you. To see you clearly today, God. We thank you for your sacrifice. The ultimate sacrifice that you paid. So now we have the opportunity to sacrifice things to you. To give to you. We love you and we praise you, Father, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and grab a seat. How is everyone doing this morning? There's a, there's a good energy here today. You guys feel it? Like worship, just God is moving. Amen. And we're going to dive into his word. And uh, just a little recap. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we wrapped up the series in Romans 8. And we talked about the gospel of Jesus and what that means for us for eternity and what that means for our salvation. And then we started Romans 12 last week. And we started that this is the, the letter that is being written. Now that you've heard the gospel, now that you've heard the good news and you've accepted Jesus into your life, what now? How should you live? And today is really a letter of saying how should the church live? How should the body of Christ live? live under this gospel. So let's jump into it. Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. The scripture's behind me on the screen, or you can follow along. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, function so is it with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. The key phrase there, so it is with Christ's body. 
What this is proclaiming is that the body of Christ, us, us here, the body of Christ, that we belong to Christ Jesus. He is the head. He, he is the leader of this body. He is in charge. It says in uh, Colossians 1, Christ is also the head of the church, which is the body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. So he should be put first in everything we do. As, as a body of Christ, Christ should be first in everything we do. And when we do that, knowing that he is head, knowing that he is in charge, how should we, as the body of Christ, follow? The first way we should follow is we should follow through submission. That, that we are called, as followers of Christ, to submit to him. To, to, as we talked about last week, to set our life apart, to, to worship him and submit to him, to his plan, his will, his direction. We are called to submission. We are called to trust. As, as followers of Christ, we are called to trust him. I don't know about if there's anybody else in the room, but if you ever had a season where God has called you, where Jesus has called you into a season and you have to trust where he's walked you right to the edge and he said, okay, you can't see what's going to happen, but I need you to trust me. I mean, I, there's so many testimonies as I hear from people as I felt like Jesus was calling me to do this. I didn't know the outcome, but I trusted him and he is good. As followers of Christ, we are called to trust him and we are called to, to follow his vision. We're called to follow his vision for the church. Now, this is very huge here because we all have visions of what the church should look like. We all do that. We, all, we, have, we have this thing in our head that says this is what the church should look like. This is how it should work. But as a Christ follower, it's not what I think is right. It's what he thinks is right. And we are called to follow his vision. And in Romans 12, we're about to get a very clear vision of what that is. We're, get, we're about to see what that looks like. So let's dive into it. It says each part has a special function. Each part of this body of Christ has a special function. Think of it as the human body, right? If we were made just of hands, we wouldn't get very far. If we were just eyes, we wouldn't get very far either. We would see a lot, but we couldn't go to it. That every part of our body is important, even the pinky toe. Do you ever think about this? Like sometimes I look down at my pinky toe and I'm like, what are you for? Why are you here? You know why the pinky toe is there? It balances you. The human body would be off balance if the pinky toe wasn't there. This little piece of bone holds up all of this. <laughs> What's to say is the pinky toe is important to the human body, and you are important to the body of Christ. You are. You might think you're just a pinky toe. And maybe you are a pinky toe, but you are a valuable pinky toe. You are a part of what God is doing in the city of Reno. You are not just this, you are this, and you bring something to the table. You matter. You matter. And I know that there's some people in this room today that the enemy has convinced you you don't. He's convinced you that, that your role is small, your role isn't important, but you need to hear me on this. When it comes to the body of Christ, when it comes to Christ Jesus, you matter. And someone is counting on your role. Someone's counting on your role to play your part. You matter here. And then it says we are many parts of one body. The body cannot function without a diversity of parts, like I said. If we all looked the same and we acted the same, it wouldn't be a functioning body. The, the body of Christ, just like the human body, needs diversity of parts to function properly. And what this is saying is, is Romans 12 has given us a breakdown of how to thrive as a church. How to thrive as the body of Christ. So if we're going to thrive as a church, we need to thrive in diversity. And here's how I believe we thrive in diversity. First, we celebrate differences. 
We celebrate differences. We celebrate the fact that, that you look different than me. We celebrate the fact that you talk different than me. I just had a conversation with someone in the lobby who's from Texas. They talk way different than me. That's great. That's great. We celebrate the differences of each other because what you're gifted at, I might not be gifted at. And God's going to use you in a different way than he's going to use me. We celebrate the diversity. We celebrate the differences because the enemy's going to try to turn us against each other. He's going to try to manipulate us to turn on each other. But we can fight that through celebration. Amen? Amen. We celebrate conversation. We celebrate the ability to have a conversation with each other even if we don't see the world the same. Even if we have different opinions on things, we celebrate the fact that because of Christ Jesus, we can sit down with each other and have a conversation. I call this righteous disagreement. <laughs> that, 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 we, that we are being righteous and holy, that we are okay disagreeing. We celebrate that. And the last thing to thrive in diversity is we celebrate change. We celebrate when things change. We don't dig our heels in and say, this is the way it's supposed to be. You know, one of my mentors once told me, we were going through a really hard season of transition at the church I was at before here. And he said to me, you know, change is hard, Shane. But it's easier than death. It, it is. Change is hard. But it's easier than death. And with Jesus, with Jesus at our core, we can get through change. But we, when we learn to celebrate it, when we learn to celebrate the difference of what God is doing, we have to celebrate change. And then it goes on to read in Romans 12, and we all belong to each other. Just as there's many parts that play specific roles, we all belong to each other. Just as we need to thrive in diversity, the body of Christ needs to thrive in unity. We need to be unified. So how do we thrive in unity? One, we confront pride. We confront pride in our life. We confront this idea of what is in me that maybe is being prideful, that I'm looking at this person differently. I'm looking at this outreach differently. I'm looking at what God says differently. I know that this, I have this conversation with myself all the time. It's even part of like my morning prayers. God, take away whatever is prideful in me. Take away whatever is prideful with me. And that's a dangerous prayer to pray. Because that's going to hurt. We have to confront pride in ourselves if we're going to thrive in unity. We have to confront lies. We have to confront the lies that maybe we believe for a long time. We have to confront the lies that the enemy is trying to whisper into our ears. To, to turn us against each other. To, to, to shape us against each other. We have to confront the lies. And we need to confront walls. We need to confront the walls that we've built up in our lives that are stopping us from being unified. Because we might have differences on how we view the world. We might have differences on how the church should be run. We might have differences on what kind of food you like. And these things can become walls. But there is one thing that we all have in common as sons and daughters of Christ Jesus. And that is Jesus Christ. We can be unified. Even in our differences. Isn't that a beautiful message for the world we live in today? That we can find unity with each other, even in our differences. Because here's the truth. The enemy is a divider. He's a divider. The enemy, Satan, wants to divide us. He wants us to be on opposite ends, not agreeing and getting angry at each other. But Christ is a unifier. So we need to fight against this idea of being divided and remember that we are unified in Christ. So if we're going to thrive as a church, we need to thrive in diversity and we need to thrive in unity. And as we continue to read here, it says this in Romans 12, 6. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability of prophecy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. In his grace... God has given us different gifts. As he's talking to the church, meaning that he's created us and he's given us different things. And we're about to jump into some of those gifts there, but he's given us different things. But what is key here is that he gave them. 
That these gifts that are from the Holy Spirit, the gifts from God, are not earned. They're not merit-based. They're not based on this person's more righteous than this person. These gifts are given by the grace of Jesus Christ. He distributes the gifts. He decides who gets it. Actually, the ancient Greek word for spiritual gifts means charismata. It's called charismata. And that actually translates into gift of grace. So when we say spiritual gifts, in the original translations, we are saying God gave us gifts of grace. Even though we didn't deserve them. Even though we're broken, because of his grace, he still gives us gifts. In uh, Corinthians 12, 11, it says, but one and the same spirit works all these things out, distributing to each individually as he wills. So before we get into these gifts, I want to talk about two things we need to focus on as we think about these spiritual gifts given from God. The first thing, don't abuse your gifts. Don't abuse them. As God has given you these amazing gifts for doing amazing things, you are called to uplift others. These gifts that are given by grace should never be for you to, to reap the benefits from. They're, they're for building up the church, building up each other. This is not gifts given for you to build your platform or to say your message. These gifts are given by Jesus so they can be shared with the world so the gospel of Jesus can be preached. Amen? The second thing that I want you to focus on as we talk about these gifts, don't limit your gifts. Don't limit them. Don't, don't limit yourself to saying that I, I, I can't do much. I'm not great. I don't have what it takes. You're right. You aren't great. But Jesus is. You know, I, I, some of us need to hear that. Like, I'm not a great person. I'm not the best. But I serve the greatest of the greats. And I don't need to limit the gifts he's given me because I can trust in him that he is going to be powerful. He is going to give me what I need. Amen? This isn't your work. You're not bringing anything to the table here. This is Christ and Christ alone. So let's go through these gifts. So if God has given you the ability of prophecy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. Prophecy. Prophecy mean, it means to speak forth, to speak forth. And in New Testament living, this is a proclamation, a foretelling, not a prediction, a foretelling. What it's saying here is that this, this New Testament gift of prophecy is, is telling what has already been revealed through the, the scriptures, through the completed work of Jesus Christ, that you will be able to, to reveal that to people. Now, in the Old Testament, when it talked about prophecy, they were prophesying new revelation. They were prophesying things that were new, that the, this new revelation. But when Jesus came and, and God inspired the word of God, our job, if we have this gift of prophecy now, is just to proclaim or to speak forth the revealed words of God. And what that might look like is it might be like biblical wisdom. Biblical wisdom. Uh, God said live like this. God's word, his scripture says if you live like this, here's this. People who have the gift of prophecy will speak like that. They might give you biblical caution. God said don't do that. You know, I, there's a funny story. Uh, I was just at the park with my daughter Harper. And uh, there was this thing at the park that was like this wheel that went around. The kids sat inside, and it spun really fast. And she had this fun thing where she was like, every time this little metal bar would pass, she would try to put her hand down. She wanted to like, oh, quick I am, Daddy. And I just remember, hey, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, and she like looked up at me, and she was like, still, you know, hey, don't do that. And then eventually... That pole caught her finger. And she gets up screaming. She's like, why wouldn't you stop me? <laughs> you know, she didn't really say that. But that's like how we live as Christians sometimes, right? God speaks to his people through the word of God. And they're like, don't do that. Don't do that. And we're like, 
Why wouldn't you tell me? Pastor, why don't you preach on that? <laughs> biblical wisdom. And the next thing a prophet will uh, speak to is biblical hope. They will refer to the scriptures of God and speak of that hope we talked about in Romans 8. This hope of Jesus, this hope of eternity. This is not new revelation. They're not predicting the future. They are revealing what God already revealed to humanity. So if you have the gift of prophesy, prophecy. Prophecy, prophesy, sorry. It says this as we continue to read. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach them well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. Mark 9.35 says this, And he, Jesus, sat down and called the twelve to him and said to them, If any one of you wants to be first, you must be last and servant of all. If God has given you the, the gift of service, the gift of servanthood, that he's given you that gift to serve others, you are not less than. The words of God say that, that whoever is last will be first. And if you are, that you have this gift of service, here's some things I just want to kind of talk to you when, it's, when it comes to serving God. You need to be available. You need to be available. The question I ask myself, am I leaving room in my life to be available to God? If he's given me this gift of service, am I being, leaving room in my life so when he creates opportunities, I have the ability to step into them? The next thing when it comes to servanthood is you need to be thoughtful. You need to be thoughtful. You need to, to be thinking and praying and seeking and viewing the world through that lens of saying, Jesus, how can I be of service today? How can I serve you today, Jesus? And you need to be present. As, as, as if, you're in, if you're serving someone, there's nothing worse that we can do when we're serving someone when they feel like a checklist. Do you get what I'm saying there? That, that when, we, when we're serving people, that they, they're not just a checklist item to us. They're not a box that we get to check off. They are a child of God. That's why I love our home team when they open those doors and they say hi and they wave to me. And like, I know that they're not just doing it because they have to. They're doing it because they care about me. We need to be present. And then it says, if you are a teacher, teach well. We come into this world needing to be taught, Right? We need to learn every, we, need, we need to learn how to speak properly. I'm still working on that one. We need to learn how to read and how to write and how to ride our bike and everything in this world we need to be taught. So if we need to be taught, that means that God will gift people to be teachers. And if you are gifted to be a teacher and a, gifted to be a teacher of the word of God, is what it's saying is, is that you will understand the scriptures, you will have this biblical knowledge that, that is teach, you're able to teach others. You're able to see the word of God and to, to offload that to people on a level they'll be able to understand that this, this word of God. Some of you are going to be called to teach, to, to reveal what God's word says to his people. And then it says, if your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging if your gift isn't to encourage, be encouraging. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Therefore, encouraging one another and build one another up just as you're doing. Who knows that our world needs encouragement? Like our world needs encouragers right now. And some of you have that gift. That God has just given you that gift to bring encouragement to people. And I think there's two types of people in the world. There's, there's builders and then there's crashers. There's some people who, who when, when you talk to them, they build you up. They, 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 they lift you up. And then there's some people you talk to that tear you down, that, that, that crash things in you, that hurt you, that, that harm you. See, builders, people with the gift of encouragement, when they build you up, They'll, they'll, they'll talk about grace and hope and peace and a future. And crashers will talk about shame and regret and pain. 
as we are called to be encouraging to one another. We are called to spur each other on. And, and there's, there's different levels of this encouragement, right? You don't have to be this just crazy, out of the box, super happy person. Like, here, let me put this in. Has anybody ever met that person who is just like super saved? Like super, like when you walk into the room and you're like, hey, how's it going? Well, it's a good day under the sun with Jesus Christ, amen? <laughs> you're like, wow, that's so uplifting. And it's like that person I envision like could get shot. And he'd be like, God is good. God is good. Like, that's, that's one way of the gift of encouragement. That it just seems like they're able to encourage through any season or any trial. But there is quiet encouragement. You know, like Pastor Dan is this for me. Pastor Dan brings so much encouragement to my life. Now, Dan isn't the loudest person in the world. He's not flamboyant and crazy and out there. He's just true to his word. He says things to me that build me up. If you have the gift of encouragement, be encouraging. And if it is giving, give generously. If it is giving, give generously. What it is saying here is that when you have the gift of giving, people who have the gift of giving will see a need and say, I'm called to be a part of fixing it. I am called to see that need and to, to step into it. People who have the gift of generosity and giving hold their things with open hands. That, that they see everything that God has given them as just a gift to be shared, to be distributed out. When they see that need, they go home and they, they can't sleep. They say, what can I do to help? And it says to give generously. If you have this gift of generosity, give generously, open-handed with your wealth and time. And if God has given you the leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. If God has put you in a position of leadership, and given you the ability to be a leader, you need to take this seriously. I believe leaders change the world. Leaders change the world. Leaders change the world. And you can't take this calling lightly. Wherever your sphere of leadership is, if, if your leadership sphere is a group of five people, don't take that lightly. God has put you there right now to lead them well. For the people in the room who are leading large organizations with large amounts of people, don't take it lightly that each one of those people are counting on you to lead them. And not just lead them to, to, to more money, not just to lead them to better standing, but to lead them to the feet of Jesus by how you live. They're watching you. So if we're going to lead, there's three things I want us to take away from this. If we're going to lead, we need to lead from the back. We need to lead from the back. That, 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 that we would step back and allow God to take the lead. For, for God to be the leader and for us to be the follower. When people view you as a leader, do they see you first or God first? Who do they see? We need to lead with purpose. Like I said, focused on the bigger vision of God's kingdom and not our kingdom. And third one, if you're going to be a leader and you're going to lead others, you have to lead yourself first. I'm telling you, there's times I'm writing messages or I'm talking to interns or staff and I'm, I'm, I'm leading them into something and God just convicts me. Shane, are you doing that? Are you leading yourself in that, Shane? If we are going to be leaders and God has given us that ability, we have to lead ourselves. We have to practice what we preach. We can't fake this. And then it says, and if you give the gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Do it gladly. If you get the gift of showing kindness, do it with a glad heart. Do it, do it without the, do it without the I, getting paid back. Do it without the people seeing. You know, this idea of giving and this idea of generosity and kindness. You know, we live in a culture that says do it for the gram, right? Like do it for Instagram. 
Do it so you can post a picture and everybody will clap for you. Yay! You're a good person. Like, no, that's not why we should do it. When we do these things, when we live this life of leadership, we should do it out of the overflow. The overflow of grace and worship that we have for Jesus. If nobody saw, if nobody saw, we would do it anyway. And there's this great example that lives this out. It's when Jesus is getting close to the end of his time here on earth. And he, he's getting ready for the cross and he gathers his disciples together. And he, it says that he gathers them and then he takes his robe off and wraps a towel around himself. And at that moment, he kneels down to a position of servanthood, to a position of lowering himself, the King of Kings, the Messiah, the Lord of Lords, kneels down and takes the towel and he begins to pour water into a bucket just like this. He begins to pour water. And then he says to his disciples, the ones he's leading, he says, come and let me wash your feet. Come and let me wash your feet. And the disciples are resistant. No, Jesus. We should be washing your feet. But he's, he says, I want to show you the way. If you want to change the world, if, if, you want, if you want to have impact in the world, let me show you the posture you should take. And as he began to put the disciples' feet in and reach into the water, and to wash their feet clean. These dirty feet. These dirty feet. The king of kings. He said, I'm willing to wash it. And what he's showing you is this, this visual of now I wash your feet. But in a couple days I'm going to go to the cross. And my blood's going to be shed. And my blood will wash you clean forever. But if you are going to be a leader... As, as the church, the body of Christ, this should be the position of the body of Christ. We should never be standing and standing on our own will, but we should be kneeling to the one true God saying, how can I serve you? How can I serve you, God? It's such a beautiful visual to me that Jesus, who had every right to stay in heaven, this perfect God-man is washing feet. You know, in those times, the, the, the washing feet was a place for servants. A place for, for someone of lower standing because the feet carried all the dirt from the day. It carried all the, 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 the troubles. And when they walked in, they would need to cleanse their feet before they brought that dirt into the house. And what Jesus is doing is saying, I'm not beneath this. I'm not beneath this. You shouldn't be either. As God's people come to us dirty and broken, carrying all this stuff into the body of Christ. Let us be a group of people who are willing to get on our knees and worship him from this posture. To love his people from this posture. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. God, we praise you. We thank you for who you are, God, and we thank you for setting us free. And I pray that as we move forward, God, this would be our posture. This would be our stance, Father, that, that we would get on our knees and worship you and serve your people well. Give us that heart, God. Let us use our gifts to honor you and bring glory to your name. We love you and praise you in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Again, we're just so happy you're here. Um, don't forget today, um, if, if um, something moved in you today and you're curious about what uh, your spiritual giftings might be or 
how to use your spiritual gifting to, choose to uh, serve God's church, text that word connect me with no spaces to 411247 and someone will reach out to you uh, this week. We have teams that can help you kind of discern what that is and explain how to use your gifts. Um, also, uh, seven minute me, it's going to start in just a few minutes over here. And if you need prayer, don't forget to just take a seat in the pews and someone will be with you shortly to pray with you. Go with God. Bless you.